This past week, I was calling my patients the night before surgery until one patient said, Doc, I wish I had known that my body was going to have <laughs> Welcome to the most mysterious and secretive place in the world. This is the operating room where we wipe your memories when you come in here and sometimes take away your memory of experiences that might help you heal your mind as much as your body during surgery. And before we get started, it would mean a lot to me if you could hit that like button or subscribe button to keep up with all the medical secrets that I share that help show you just how much power you have over your body because it's probably more than you've ever been told. Anesthesia is a totally unnatural state for your body to safely undergo the totally unnatural state of surgery where you're literally being cut open and anesthesia helps prevent you from having a heart attack, a stroke, kicking the surgeon, swiping at the anesthesiologist like me, or having major PTSD from the experience. It's an incredible tool in medicine, but it also comes at the expense of turning off all sorts of body functions that you need to survive. Things like your breathing, your heart rate, and your emotions, and all your brain function. Today, I wanna to share the top three things that you don't know that happens to your body when you're unconscious under anesthesia. And the power is that once you learn what happens to your body, you can be prepared for it. And the more prepared you are, the safer and more comfortable your surgery can be. And as a bonus, I'm gonna give you my favorite natural biohacks to make the whole surgical experience even safer and less painful. Let's get started. Number one, your emotions under anesthesia. Have you ever heard of anyone, or maybe yourself, waking up kicking, screaming, crying, or delirious after anesthesia or surgery? Well, you better believe that it's possible because anesthesia turns off the frontal cortex of your brain, literally disinhibits you, and all those things that you wouldn't say ordinarily, you might say or do under anesthesia. Now, a lot of things can cause this in addition to the anesthesia itself. Things like pain on top of the disinhibition, dehydration, being hungry, low oxygen, high carbon dioxide, being in an unfamiliar environment like in the ICU or a hospital bed. All these things can contribute to your delirium after surgery. But there's also lots of things that you can do to help prevent it. And that's important because we believe that delirium might be linked with post-operative memory deficits or cognitive deficits. We still don't know exactly what causes memory problems after surgery and anesthesia, but we believe that if we can reduce delirium, we might be able to also reduce those other brain complications after surgery, especially in the elderly. Fortunately, there are some techniques we know that might be able to reduce delirium after surgery. Anesthesia totally disrupts your REM sleep cycles. We believe that melatonin, either from its antioxidant effects or maybe from its restoration of circadian rhythm, might be able to help reduce the incidence of delirium. We still don't know for sure though, so I don't make that a blanket recommendation for all my patients, but something to consider. The number one most important thing is your mindset before surgery, because how you fall asleep probably impacts to an extent how you wake up. The more peaceful and calm you fall asleep, likely the less delirious you are when you wake up versus falling asleep anxious, in fear, terror, angry or frustrated, probably more likely to wake up with delirium as well, maybe swiping or hitting or kicking or screaming or crying. Unfortunately, you can't take a lot of the supplements that you might ordinarily take. Things like valerian root, which can ordinarily be very powerful for relaxing your body, it can't necessarily take before and after surgery. That opens up the role of mind-body practices. Things like breath work, incredibly powerful, acupuncture, mindset, addressing depression, and in particular, reducing pain catastrophizing, which can decrease your pain threshold. Making sure your depression is under control and pain catastrophizing under control, whether it be through CBT, ACT, or any other types of therapies, can be very powerful to not only help reduce delirium after surgery, but to also reduce the risk of depression after surgery. Aromatherapy can also be effective before surgery. Lavender is probably one of my favorites. Music therapy also has a role very safe before surgery and can be very helpful in a specific subset of patients. And lastly, and maybe also the most important, would be the healing environment that you're in, whether it's the ICU or a hospital bed. If you're surrounded by loved ones, friends, family, in a peaceful environment, you're more likely to be peaceful on the inside and less likely to have delirium 
confusion and agitation of patients in unfamiliar environments. One of my favorite studies looks at patients in hospital rooms that look at a brick wall versus those that look at a scenic view of nature. And sure enough, the patients in the hospital rooms with the scenic views did better than the ones staring at a brick wall. The number two thing that patients don't know that happens to their body when they're under anesthesia is getting a breathing tube like this one, or like this one. And that's because one of the important reflexes that anesthesia turns off is your breathing reflex. And you need to breathe because without oxygen in your body, you might suffer heart attacks, strokes, or other organ failure. That's why we need to place a breathing tube like one of these and connect you to a ventilator like the one behind me to continuously give you oxygen in your lungs to distribute to the rest of your body. Now, why do we have so many different types of breathing tubes? Well, one of them, like this one, the endotracheal tube, is a little bit more invasive. It goes in deeper into your mouth, past your vocal cords. This one, the LMA, doesn't go quite as deep and also has fewer chances of side effects, so less chance of sore throat, hoarseness, and dental damage. Both can cause it, the LMA less likely. So why don't I always use the LMA if it has fewer side effects? Who wants to wake up with a sore throat or broken teeth? Well, it depends on your body weight and acid reflux and your surgery type. Patients with a normal body weight without acid reflux are great candidates for the LMA. However, obesity with poorly controlled acid reflux means that I need to use the more invasive breathing tube like this one for your safety. Getting your acid reflux under control is one of the easiest ways to help me use this breathing tube instead of this one, though it also depends on the surgery type. So you want to avoid spicy foods the night before and take your anti-reflux medications if you've been directed to do so by your doctor. You might still get a sore throat from either type of breathing tube. The best natural therapies are going to be things like licorice lozenges, arnica, green tea gargles, and maybe honey. Additionally, guided imagery can actually be very powerful for dry throat that you may have after either type of breathing tube as well. And the third thing that patients don't know that happens to their body when they're under anesthesia is abolishing your heart's reflexes. That's right. Ordinarily, your heart rate and blood pressure adjust to your activity level so that you don't have a heart attack or a stroke or kidney damage. But when you're under anesthesia, your body loses its reflex to regulate its blood pressure and heart rate. And that's why we need to use so many powerful cardiac medications, things like epinephrine or adrenaline, noradrenaline or norepinephrine, or any other number of cardioactive medications when you're under anesthesia. It's part of the critical life support that keeps your body functioning when you're under anesthesia. Now, what are the most powerful ways to help minimize the chances of side effects from losing your heart's reflexes? One of the most important things you can do to help protect your heart is to not use illicit substances in the month before your surgery. Things like marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamines can all have serious effects on your cardiovascular system when you're under anesthesia and you lose your body's normal heart reflexes. Marijuana is tricky because it's so lipophilic that it can hang around the central nervous system for up to a month after you're abstaining if you're a regular user. Next is to focus on your physical activity and conditioning before your surgery. The better conditioned your heart and muscles are before you come into the operating room, the more anesthesia you can tolerate with a fewer chance of side effects and complications. And lastly, if you have high blood pressure and you take blood pressure medications, be sure to discuss with your doctor which medications you should stop and which medications you should continue to make sure that your heart is still functioning even with its impaired reflexes. There you have it, the top three things that patients don't know that happen to their body when they're unconscious under anesthesia. I hope you learned a lot from this and also learned how much you can take outside the operating room to hopefully live your life with fewer medications and should you ever need surgery, know how to be prepared. And more important than all of that, I hope you've learned just how much power you have over your body because it's probably more than you've ever been told. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. If you did, be sure to follow and share with your loved ones. And leave comments below and let me know what other secrets you want to know about the human body so that you can control your inner healing potential.